Uh, before I get started, I just want to say a, a word of thanks to the outstanding faculty of the history department at this university. Um, they have challenged me, pushed me, prodded me to become a better writer and researcher, and uh, they are absolutely uh, uh, on the highest on the highest caliber of academics. Um, also, the uh, uh, merciless red pen of Dr. Crane uh, has uh, has brought me to this place where I am today. The research I'm going to share with you is original. Um, there are original documents uh, in this research, contain this research, and after the end of the presentation, we'll do a, a Q&A session if you want to find out more about citation sources and locations of the information. Um, so, back in 1859, Daniel Decatur Emmett was composing a song for the Bryant's Minstrels in a New York apartment on a rainy day. As he looked outside at the dreary rain, a thought echoed across his mind. I wish I was in Dixie. In just a couple of years, that same line would be sung on battlefields across the country. It's interesting to me that Emmett wrote this song in a New York apartment because the saying is so Southern. You ain't just whistling Dixie means that you really know what you're talking about. About two years ago, while I was beginning research for this project, my alma mater, Southside High School, was at the center of a controversy involving its mascot, fight song, and even some of its longtime faculty. As the mascot controversy arose, defenders of Johnny Reb used words, romantic words like tradition, excellence, and community to defend the image. And what they probably didn't know is that back in 1966, as three-year-old Southside was receiving upgraded curriculum and being accredited with the by the National Board of Education, that the all-black 81-year-old Lincoln High School was using outdated textbooks, playing on broken band equipment, and holding classes in a crowded gymnasium. Does it sound like community excellence to me? Through over two years of research, I have discovered that Fort Smith like many cities all across America, has been racially engineered, the demography that is, through the manipulation of school zones. It's time to uncover the Mason-Dixon line of our fair community, especially as it pertains to the city's high schools on the north side and the south side. The title of my talk today is Whistling Dixie because it will separate the history from the hearsay. During the late 1950s, several Arkansas cities made headlines due to integration. In 1954, Fayetteville High Schools were lauded in the newspapers because of the smooth transition. In 1955, Hoxie, Arkansas shut down schools completely in order to prevent a small handful of black students from attending. Little Rock made international news in 1957 when nine black students were barred from entering the Central High School by thousands of angry whites in protest. But here at Fort Smith, there were no cameras, no mob, no newspapers, just one little boy. Six-year-old Charles Nichols was the first African-American to integrate a Fort Smith public school in 1957. Fort Smith's integration was so quiet that it's practically lulled historians to sleep. But the fact remains that by avoiding open defiance in the courts, the school board was able to use bureaucratic heel dragging to maintain segregated schools for decades, and no one even noticed, except for the African Americans. Historically, white students in Fort Smith attended Fort Smith High 
which would later become Northside High. Lincoln High, the only black secondary school at the time, bused students in from as far as 60 miles away, housing grades 7 through 12. At that time, Fort Smith had a black population of about 10%, second only behind Little Rock at 30%. For decades, Fort Smith blacks had attended board meetings, filed signature petitions, and protested discriminatory policies by the school board. But very little was ever done on behalf of the black schools. And the school board publicly denied any discrepancies, despite hard evidence to the contrary. In 1954, the board hired a consultant group from the George Peabody College in Nashville to do an impartial audit of the Fort Smith school system. The team headed by noted academic W.D. McCorkin drafted a 258-page document known as the Peabody Survey Report. The Peabody Report confirmed what black parents had long been saying about the disparity between the high schools, including the poor facilities and the curriculum. But it praised Lincoln High's outstanding teachers for developing comprehensive strategies to reach their students. Teachers at Lincoln had always done more with less. Regardless of these facts, Fort Smith's integration plan continued relatively unchallenged until the early 1960s, when three dynamic personalities collided at the crossroads of history. Chris Corbin, superintendent of the special school district of Fort Smith. He was a master politician and well respected in the community. The challenge for you today will be to decide if Mr. Corbin was the villain in this drama or if he was merely a product of his generation. In the center we have Dr. H.P. McDonald, the president of the Fort Smith chapter of the NAACP, who was a respected physician and a community leader. He became the mentor who coached the true hero of the Fort Smith integration story, Mrs. Corrine Rogers to the right. She was a brave mother, an activist, a philanthropist, a faithful warden of the church. She lived in Fort Smith her entire 94 years. She volunteered, sat at segregated lunch counters, and raised nine college graduates. In 1961, the school board minutes describe plans for a second white high school, a new black elementary, and additions to the Lincoln plan. By this time, Fort Smith should have been integrated up to grade five, making the new black grade school unnecessary. This angered black residents. On February 27, 1961, more than 200 black citizens attended the school board meeting to protest the construction of the new elementary school. Board President Owen Pierce responded by saying that, quote, only 10% of eligible Negro children had chosen to attend integrated schools, end quote. Pierce was referring to the voluntary transfer provision, a part of the original integration plan introduced back in 1954. The transfer provision reads, quote, no pupil whose race or color is in the minority in a given school should be required to attend that school. He should be allowed but not required to attend the school nearest his home in which his race or color predominates, end quote. The attended zones in question were all located within the mixed communities on the Fort Smith's north side. This transfer provision allowed whites to flee integrating schools while encouraging blacks to remain in schools where they were already in the majority. This built-in loophole built a limited integration <coughs> while technically observing the letter of the law. This was a classic Jim Crow tactic that was in vogue during the Civil Rights era. The school board minutes explicitly stated that the new white high school was to be called Southside. Southside was built within the new affluent housing developments on the city's southeastern edge. This essentially meant that segregated schools were available to those who could afford it. The new Southside attendance area not only served as a racial barrier, but it also served as a class barrier. Attendance Committee Chairman Bill Morin confirmed this strategy when he said, quote, factors such as total integration should not affect Southside appreciably 
end quote. Now it should be noted that Mr. Morin said this in 1966, three years after Southside was built. Mr. Morin was right. Southside wouldn't see its first two black students until 1974. If you're not familiar with the term white flight, it simply means that white families move out of an area that becomes more racially diverse, whether it's housing or schools or, or whatnot. And it's a phenomenon that's fairly popular in the Jim Crow South. Dr. H.P. McDonald experienced this firsthand in 1964 <clears throat> when he tried to buy a house in an affluent white neighborhood on the city's northern side. Before he could make an offer, a group of white residents formed a corporation bought the house out from under him. And this is documented by multiple sources, including newspapers and eyewitness accounts. Perhaps the white establishment was scared of successful blacks like McDonald. Not to be deterred, Dr. McDonald continued to challenge the white establishment at sit-ins and by lobbying for the NAACP. In a 2001 interview, McDonald described an incident where he was frustrated by the school board's unchecked power. McDonald uh, had on numerous occasions attempted to reason with Superintendent Chris Corbin regarding integration, but was unsuccessful. So he decided to make a run for the school board himself. During that era, in order to get a position on the school board, you had to do it by a show of support. This mob rule election system was done in favor of a more democratic process. McDonald had managed to gather 500 supporters with him in a bid for the position on the school board. Just moments before the meeting, Superintendent Chris Corbin suspended proceedings while he phoned in support from the Knights of Columbus and the local bowling clubs. Corbin had his supporters bus to the Northside campus to blockade McDonald's attempt for the at-large election. Chris Corbin was characterized as an ardent racist by African Americans who knew him at the time. McDonald called him a bully who intimidated black te teachers in order to keep them from applying at the white schools. NAAC member and lifetime resident Yuva Winton recalls Corbin telling her, quote, there will never be any Negros at Northside, end quote. The full wrath of Corbin was provoked on September 12, 1963 when McDonald and Pine Bluff attorney George Howard filed suit on behalf of two Lincoln High students, Janice and Patricia Rogers. Patricia is not pictured here. The Rogers girls had been part of a strategic plan by the NAACP to force the integration issue. The plan was originally uh, hatched about a year earlier and involved 12 volunteer families. But after individuals from the families were told they would be thoroughly investigated, only the Rogers girls remained. This type of intimidation tactic was common at the time. Undaunted, Corrine Rogers, the girl's mother, was quoted saying, I have nothing to hide. The primary integration issue for Fort Smith Blacks was the disparity between the curriculum and education quality offered between the two schools. Northside offered 64 subjects to Lincoln's 34, placing black students at a disadvantage. Corrine Rogers recalled an encounter with Corbin after the suit was filed and he said, quote, you should be thankful for what you have. Arkansas schools will never be integrated." End quote. While the suit was awaiting trial, Southside opened its doors for the first time with the intention that it would remain white indefinitely. Summer of 1964 was pivotal for civil rights in America and in Fort Smith. The Rogers suit was timely following the Civil Rights Act of 1964 by only a month. The landmark case came to be known simply as Rogers versus Paul, setting an important precedent for civil rights litigation. The Rogers Council argued that the school board was, quote, maintaining a dual scheme of attendance areas based solely on race, end quote. The accusations of gerrymandering by the board went beyond the courtroom, however. The Peabody survey also put into question the board's administrative practices, stating, and this is a long quote here, Student placement has been loosely handled for lack of clear-cut zoning regulations, applied equally to all, and the survey staff has noted the lack of clarity in outlining the school zone and evidences of failure to administer this program with consistency and objectivity." End quote. After news of the lawsuit hit the papers, Corrine's husband, Bill Rogers, lost his job. 
The Rogers family feared for their safety. Patricia Rogers remembers that her mother never lost her composure in front of the children, but those years were a time of great fear and worry for the Rogers family. The district court's ruling did put an end to the voluntary transfer provision, halting segregation at the junior high level. You can see here the quote by Corbin, uh, paraphrased for the paper, said that only major change in the revised plan was the elimination of a provision for students to change schools at will out of their attendance area. Subsequently, Lincoln dropped grades seven and eight, integrating 185 students into the white junior highs nearest their homes. Chris Corbin was also quoted as saying by the Southern School News that he had received innumerable telephone calls from white residents who threatened to move their children to private schools, transfer outside the district, or boycott the Negro schools entirely, end quote. On Thursday night, August 13, 1964, about 200 white Northside residents descended on the board meeting in protest. The coup attempt, however, could not stop the inevitable. The junior high schools did integrate, reinvigorating the white exodus from the neighborhoods on the north side of town. H.P. McDonald had publicly chastised the school board for drawing the north side high school attendance area in a quote, look like fashion, end quote, so as to avoid integration, which you can see here. The blank areas are the Lincoln High School attendance areas. North side and south side uh, attendance areas are relatively unchanged still to this day. Um, as you can see, north side attendance areas still covered, uh, covered borrowing at this time as well. But what I'm about to show you is not news to people who have grown up in this community or lived here a very long time. But here is a map of the current African American demography of Fort Smith with the dark red being the highest concentrations of African American citizens. If you look, things haven't changed a whole lot in 35, I'm sorry, not 35, 55 years. It's interesting to me that as of 2016, Southside has a minority population of 37%, while Northside's minority report is over 75. This, of course, includes all minorities, not just blacks. But it's interesting to me that the same two areas from 1963 are still mostly segregated. You will see this pattern in Little Rock and in most larger cities across America. Rogers versus Paul reached the U.S. Supreme Court in 1965. While the stair-step integration plan had been implemented back in 1954, it was finally laid to rest. By this time, Fort Smith community leaders already had what they wanted, a quiet, cooperative, segregated community. Following the court order, the board opened the Northside campus to blacks at the beginning of the second semester on January 31st, 1966. The board minutes reported, quote, at that time, 76 Negro pupils from the Lincoln High School transferred to the formerly all-white Northside High School, end quote. Due to decreased enrollment, Lincoln closed its doors on June 3rd, 1966. Southside, however, remained all-white for eight more years. B is not for victory, perhaps, but maybe for vindication. Finally, black students in Fort Smith would have the same educational opportunities as whites. As I wrap up today, I will demonstrate how desegregation in Fort Smith was in fact not without incident. The 1974 75 Southside yearbook opens with a poem that reads, quote, lyrics of Dixie, change is evident to everyone. The first black students to attend Southside. Each other isn't so bad after all, end quote. Perhaps the bad being referred to was the violent school rivalry that existed. Now, as a Fort Smith native myself, I can attest to this growing up in the 1980s. There was an unbridled hatred between Northside and Southside, especially on Friday nights. And it did get violent, and it got violent frequently. Twin brothers Donald and Mike Van, the first two blacks at Southside, remember being treated like royalty the first weeks of school when suddenly all the attention stopped. 
Mike Van asked his friend on the track team about the sudden cold shoulder, and his friend responded by saying, they knew you guys were coming over here. They told everybody to make you feel welcome, so each one of us had to take you out to lunch at least once. Van did make friends at Southside, but the incident hurt him. The facade of tokenism was still very much alive and well in Fort Smith. The entire city of Fort Smith seemed to be driven by a nameless animosity between the two high schools, behaving as if generations of racial hatred could be vetted on a football field. <coughs> But in truth, the gladiator activities occurred mostly off the gridiron. On Thursday, September 26, 1974, eyewitnesses claimed that a group of white youths drove by Northside High School harassing black students when a shot was fired from the vehicle, narrowly missing a black youngster. The following morning, black students returned to school, some accompanied by their older siblings for protection. That same morning, as students walked to class after a pep rally, a group of whites calling themselves the Dixie Rebels started a fight in front of the Northside campus. Several students were injured, one hospitalized, and a total of 13 arrests were made. Multiple weapons were also confiscated. Later that night, the Dixie Rebels were again met by police trying to enter the Mayo Thompson Stadium during a Northside Hot Springs football game. The police officers were stationed at the Northside campus for the remainder of the year and local residents also recalled increased patrols in the neighborhoods around the school. The racial landscape of Fort Smith and its high schools remained relatively unchanged in the 1980s. H.P. McDonald continued to campaign for reforms within the district, attacking antiquated policies like the at-large election system that prevented minorities from being elected to the school board. The Fort Smith Civil War required in the ensuing decades but the city's demography, as you have seen, never changed. There is still a visible color line across the city. De facto segregation was the architect of the white privilege system that endures to this day. It continues its tunnel vision development towards the southeast, replete with shops, restaurants, and chain stores, while the once vibrant north side neighborhoods have devolved into a ghost town of zombie homes and urban blight. The special school district of Fort Smith had controlled the city's infrastructure for so long that it effectively defined what it meant to be white in Fort Smith, Arkansas. In order to be white in Fort Smith, Arkansas and enjoy all of its privileges, you had to live on the south side. Thank you.